chemical engineer, and I'm not a battery engineer. So what I've learned is uh, just from messing with batteries for the last, well, a while, and, and folks know I have a couple of QRP rigs, and, and trying to get batteries for my QRP rigs has kind of led me on this quest. Um, Frank said that batteries have come a long ways, and they have, but uh, batteries were really stuck in a rut for a hundred years. I mean, everything was lead-acid technology. And when we went from, you know, liquid lead-acid to gel cells, we thought that was a great improvement, but it was still lead-acid. It was still heavy, um, and still had a, had a lot of, of issues that it made it uh, tough for, for QRPing. And, and I mean, this is relatively recent. I mean, as recent as 10 years ago, this is what we were still using. This was state-of-the-art 10 years ago. And it made it tough to use something like a, you know, KX-1 because the battery outweighed the, the KX-1 by 10 to 1. So, you know, portable operations were, were still kind of tough. So, I, want, I mean, all of this is a battery presentation. I wanted to start out by talking about the first step, which is the rig. I mean, there's a lot of different QRP rigs out there. And... And, you know, uh, Marshall was talking about standardization. There is no standardization with QRP rigs. I mean, if you go down to HRO and buy a, a station radio, like a, you know, an 857 or an 897 or, you know, any of those, those are meant to plug into 13.7 volts, pretty much every one of them. That is not the case with QRP rigs. QRP rigs are all over the spectrum in terms of the voltage. Um, rigs like the KX-1 will run just fine on 8 volts. Um, you put 14 or 15 volts on this and it is not going to like it. At the other end of the spectrum, rigs like the Sierra uh, really don't put out hardly any power if all you're running is 8.5 or 9 volts. This rig really wants 16 volts and if you run 16 volts on just about any other Q QRP rig, you know, you're going you're to cause some damage. So one of the first steps that you have to do is to decide which rig you are going to use, because that's going to determine a lot of things. One, it's going to determine your voltage requirements, both minimum and maximum, because a lot of rigs like the, I think the KX3 has a, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's shutdown voltage is about 10.0 volts, and it, it actually, that's where it stops working. So and you I, have to scout. I don't know about this guy. Larry, Larry Fike and his famous scout that he sent back three times. Uh-uh. And they gave up on Uh-uh. It was designed for 13.8 volts, and if it went below 11, the VFO went unstable. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's true of a lot of QRP to be rigs. Operating they're, they're just, they're all over the place in terms of voltage, and they're all over the place in terms of current, too. Um, some rigs, like this one, and I think if, if you look on the second page, I've got a, some of the a characteristics for different QRP rigs. This is the one that's called the NorCal 40A. And I like to grab this first whenever I compare any QRP rigs because of everything that I've owned, this consumes the lowest current on receive. It's only 18 milliamps. I mean, on a, on a battery as tiny as this, this will go a couple of months on receive. That just draws so little power. Um, Curiously, Wayne Burdick, who had a hand in designing this years and years ago for the NorCal QRP Club, also had a hand in designing the KX3. And if you look at the KX3, I believe it takes 220 milliamps on receive. Um, you know, <laughs> a lot more than, than the NorCal 40A. And one of the worst rigs that I've ever owned, a QRP rig, is at the bottom of the list. The Tentec Argo 5, also known as the Tentec 516, 2,000 milliamps on receive. And then on transmit, requires 4.49 amps. That's only for 5 watts. And if you compare that to an 897, an 897 only needs 15 watts for 100, uh, 15 um, amps for a 100 watt output. So that makes the Tentec Argo 5 an extraordinarily um, battery hungry rig. I mean, that's not something you could ever take portable. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't get a battery big enough for this thing. So the rig that you're going to use really is the, is the first step to, to choose a battery. 
Um, one of the fortunate things about all these different batteries is their current supply capacity and their voltages are all over the place, so you really can kind of pick and choose and match them to the radio. Let's see. Oh, another thing is use parameters. Uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, soda in portable operations. Well, Frank and I have gone up a couple times, and one of the nice things about soda operation is you're only there for two hours. So when you take that into consideration, you don't really need a big battery like you'd need if you're going to spend the whole weekend. And that allows you to select a lot lighter battery, which is good for soda because you're supposed to do some walking to get there anyway. So instead of having to choose something like this for a whole weekend, you can choose a, a fairly slender and lightweight battery because you're only going to be on the air for two hours. As an example, this is a 2.6 amp hour battery and that will happily run a KX3 for an hour, uh, maybe even two if you do a lot of listening or if you work in sideband which isn't, doesn't have the duty cycle of CW. So that's another consideration where the rig is, you know, do you need a battery that's going to last a whole weekend or do you just, just need a battery to go up on top of a hill for a couple of hours? What does SOTA stand for? Summits on the air. Summits on the air. And kind of an informal exercise just going on summits and running QRP? <coughs> well, yeah. Um, actually, Frank, you want to give a little short synopsis sure. on it's It's actually pretty rigorous. Uh, there are websites. Uh, they have cho uh, the summit itself must be 500 feet of prominence. So there's, uh, of course, we're here on the front range. We're blessed. We've got about what 200 summits. Uh, 200 summits right around here, uh, and uh, so they have numbers and they have points value anywhere from two to ten points. Uh, you're allowed to do a sub once a year to activate it. Uh, they have a whole group of people listening and that sort of thing. Uh, it's uh, it's all, uh, you put your results on websites, but there are some rules. Uh, number one is you have to do the last 100 vertical feet uh, by non-mechanical means. You could ride a horse, but uh, or I suppose you could even get a team of horses and pull tower and a, and a kilowatt up the <laughs> thing if you want. Uh, there are a lot of drive up summits. There are some that are pretty uh, pretty challenging hikes. Uh, and uh, the idea is that you generally put what you want in a backpack, take it to the summit, set up an antenna, set up a radio. Uh, you're not actually limited to, to five watts. It, that The limit power limit tends to be what you're willing to put in your pack and take up to the top. Uh, it, what they didn't want is that you drive up to the top in your SUV, put the antenna up, make your five contacts, put the antenna down and leave. Uh, they wanted you to actually have to kind of get out in nature a little bit. So that's a brief overview. Uh, Steve Goldchet, is that how he pronounces it? Yeah, the, the Goat Man WG0AT is the summit coordinator for the uh, uh, zero uh, region section. So there you go. So that's SOTA. Um, and SOTA has really driven, um, not really driven this battery technology, but this battery technology has made SOTA much more attractive because it's a lot easier to haul equipment. Probably the last uh, criteria on choosing a rig is on the third page. If you look, there's a little table of power output versus current consumption. Um, of course, it's probably pretty obvious to you that the power out makes a big change in, in how much current you need, but it might be bigger than you realize. So I used the KX3 as a test rig. I kept the voltage um, a non-factor by using 13.7 volt supply. If you'll notice on 40 meters, if you set the KX1 for one watt output, the uh, current draws 0.79 amps. If you go to 5 watts out, it's 1.22 amps, so your current consumption does go up a little bit. But look at the efficiency column. I've never actually seen this used by anyone else. I'd like to find out what the efficiency of QRP rigs is in terms of how much current do they consume per watt of power output. And if you look at the KX3 on 40 meters, at 1 watt out, it's consuming 790 milliamps per watt. But look how much more efficient it gets 
if you go to 5 watts, it's only consuming 244 milliamps per watt. Uh, it's about three times more efficient. QRP rigs really want to run at full power, and that's where they're the most efficient, and you get the most bang for the buck as far as your battery. Notice also that band makes a big difference. If you um, look at the 1 watt levels on 40 meters, transmit is 0.79 amps. On 20 meters, it's 0.79 amps, but on 10 meters, it jumps to 1.03 amps. That's very, very typical that the higher you go on frequency, the more power the a rig will consume for the same power output. If you look at the difference between 40 meters and 10 meters at 5 watts, the current consumption for transmit goes from 1.22 amps up to 1.80 amp, about a 50% increase. So both band and power output make a big difference in the current draw. So that's another item to keep you know, in your mind when you choose a rig. Okay, so now you've chosen a rig and you want to go looking for a battery. And really this presentation is about two kinds of batteries. Uh, lithium polymer, or LiPO2, lithium phosphite batteries, and lithium iron batteries, or LiFePO4, which are lithium ferrophosphate batteries. And those, that's, they'll, uh, don't be misled, that's not new technology. This stuff has been around for, for three, four, five years now, but it's probably the newest readily available technology. Um, some of the let out, some on the very first page, some of the uh, different technologies uh, you're very familiar with, NICAD, nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, uh, LIPO or LIPOs, and then LIFEPO4. Those are kind of some of the current technologies in batteries. Um, we're going to talk